Good morning, and here we are once more at home with the Zen Gateway uh, on the 26th of May 2020. Um, I'll just keep chatting for a, a few seconds. Uh, if someone is around, perhaps you can just uh, like or put see and hear, if you can see and hear me, that is, um, into the uh, comment box just to uh, just to say that uh, this is getting through. Lovely. Okay. Maria Elena, thank you. Great. Okay. Just going to give it uh, a minute, I think, and we'll see. Hello. Hi. Hi, Phil. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Steve. There we go. Martina. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely. Great. Steve and Roberta. Lovely. Hello, Maria Elena. That's great. Okay, where am I? Yes, I'm. I'm in the garden. Okay, you want a, a little flash uh, of the garden? This is uh, North London, Finchley. The roses are in bloom. Thank goodness the laundry is not out. Been planting a few gem lettuces and some pak choy. Maybe we'll have a stir fry at some point. And uh, anyway, yes, a few bits and pieces there. There we go. All right. Anders is here as well. Lovely. Okay. All right. Well, I think we'll... Um... Good morning, Dush. It's a great Maggie too. All right. From up in the Highlands still. Are you... That's still where you are, Maggie, yeah? You and Dominic Cummings. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That's great. Right. Let's get on. So today we have... Um... A passage from Master Sesan. So Master Sesan said, the secret of seeing things as they are is to take off our coloured spectacles. That being as it is with nothing extraordinary about it, nothing wonderful, is the great wonder. The ability to see things normal is no small thing. To be really normal is unusual. In that normality begins to bubble up inspiration. Okay, so Master Sesan, um, he's um, uh, in sort of early part of, I think, of the 20th century or in the 20th century. Those of you who have Trevor Leggett's uh, first Zen reader, um, you may well know that, that in that book there is a translation of Master Hakuin's Song of Meditation, and that's followed by a commentary on the Song of Meditation, line by line, and that commentary is by the same Master Sesan. So, um, that gives us a sort of uh, time frame and a, and a context. So in this, he's, he's talking about seeing the secret of seeing things as they are is to take off our colored spectacles. And of course, in, um, in Zen training, in Buddhist training in general, the, the purpose of training is indeed to develop insight seeing into um, and that insight is indeed to see things as they really are. This is what it's called. So um, when we talk about the Dharma, for example, the Dharma is a, is a term, Sanskrit term, that can uh, mean the Buddha's teachings, but it also has a more mystical, transcendental uh, meaning. Um, it refers to the inherent nature of the world, or it's sometimes translated as the inherent law of the world, but it's really the, the inherent nature of things as they really are. And when the Buddha um, sat under the Bodhi tree for a week and then on the morning of the eighth day he said that he looked up into the early morning sky which is very clear cloudless and there he saw the morning star planet Venus as we know it. Uh, there's the morning star and upon that sense impact coming in um, he awoke it say he awoke uh, and became the Buddha and the the word Buddha itself means the one who is awake. It comes from the, uh, uh, the Pali Sanskrit term Bud, um, meaning to wake up. So Buddha is a title rather than a name, uh, the, the awakened one. And what he awakened to was the, was the ability to be able to see things as they really are. And the reason that that is so important is that, um, of course, the, the heart of Buddhism, the, um, the heart of the Buddha's teachings is can be summed up as suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. It's all about um, how we uh, uh, learn not to suffer uh, unnecessarily. Um, and basically, this is tied in with being ignorant, with being ignorant of the true causes of suffering. So the Buddha ties together these two notions of the reason that we suffer 
uh, the reason that we is because we create suffering for ourselves we don't understand the mechanism how we do that um, once we see into that then we can change our behavior and so reduce our suffering that's uh, that's basically the crux of it so seeing things as they really are is front and central in in buddhism and and in buddhist practice so master sesan is speaking to that and that's why we talk about awakening that's why you know terms like satori and kensho um these these, these terms which means to, to to wake up um to realize um when we realize something it means that we realize it in this body uh, as the truth in other words we see things you know as as we see things as they really are so hence why master sesan is speaking to this um so yes the secret of seeing things as they really are is to take off our colored spectacles well obviously that's a saying that's very close to the saying in english when we talk about seeing the world through rose tinted spectacles it means you know we're seeing it in a one-sided or lopsided way um Psychology knows this, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, people talk about confirmation bias. Interesting, I was just reading some articles this morning, of course, everybody's looking for antidotes and medicines to COVID-19, and uh, there was a, 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 an article about how science is, is uh, if it's not careful and, and if it rushes too quickly, uh, then it's producing poor science or poor quality science that stuff is being released as the truth before it's been before it's gone through the proper rigor necessary to establish a scientific truth um, and you know this there's this competition isn't there between this sort of impulse of, for impatience because obviously everybody you know wants to go back to their lives again and people want to find a cure and to feel safe um, if they do so so there is this strong desire to uh, to rush to rush things through and obviously some scientists are saying we need to be really careful about this because we'll give out a false hope uh, if it all goes belly up then we lose integrity people will not trust us and then where are we so um, so yes, it's important to be able to see accurately. It's important to be able to see clearly. And this ability to be able to take off our uh, spectacles that, that cause partiality. Uh, we, we have bias, confirmation bias. We, we want to believe something. And if we want to believe something, we will actively begin to look for evidence that supports it and to ignore and marginalize evidence that goes against it. So, um, yeah, so this is how we can be led astray. And the Buddha tells, um, has a, a parable uh, on this, obviously, uh, called the parable of the rope. And it concerns, it's um, a man in India, you know, at the time of the Buddha, that's 500 BC approximately, who's going home after working in the fields. Um, and it's dusk, so the light is, is sort of, you know, uh, lessening. And uh, as he's walking along the road solo, he sees a snake uh, in the middle of the path that he's walking towards. And with great alarm, because there are a lot of, you know, very poisonous snakes like cobras, etc., in India, he jumps back, you know, in horror. Uh, but the Buddha happens to be standing there, or appears, and happens to be standing there, uh, and says to the man, look again. And so the man looks again, and he realizes that what he thought was a snake in that half-light actually was just a piece of old rope uh, lying across the road. So sort of uh, with a sigh of relief, he goes to step over it. And the Buddha stops him again and says, look closely, pick it up. Uh, and so the man bends down and picks it up. And as he pulls the rope as he pulls the rope towards his eyes he suddenly realizes it's a string of gems it's not a rope it's not a snake so that's the parable um uh, it was the same object obviously all the way along um but what he thought was a snake you know was in fact something else now that's really all the buddha said as says about the parable so we sort of have to extrapolate a little bit from that you know um you know 
as I said, sort of living and working in India, snakes are an occupational hazard. Uh, and as I say, snakes like cobras, which will attack you and kill you if it bites. Obviously, they didn't have anti-venom in those days. So, you know, um, that's serious. Uh, and maybe, you know how it goes, maybe, um, you know, during the day, uh, one of his workmates had sort of said, oh, I was going on that road, you know, that you take back to your home uh, the other week. Uh, and I saw a cobra you know and you go oh right okay but still you know it was just one you know but those sort of things lodge in the back somewhere in the back of our minds somewhere and and when we are in circumstances where there's an ambivalence there's an ambiguity you know uh, here's an object that could look like a snake in the half light then our imagination produces the transformation our imagination transforms that in in this case not to the desired thing but to the feared thing um and you know he reacted that's like, <gasps> that was that emotional reaction and then when the buddha because the buddha obviously represents the part of our mind that does see clearly um when the buddha um tells him to look again you know obviously he realizes oh maybe i didn't see correctly you know so there's moments of doubt comes in so that causes a sort of declutching from that fear from him he looks again and he realizes that actually oh, it's just a piece of old rope kids probably left it or something um because you'd expect to see it but you know seeing a bit of rope on on a road you sort of thing you would expect to do what you wouldn't expect to find is a string of jewels so there's another blind there you know there's there's another fact that uh, his expectation because you just you know it doesn't cognize doesn't you don't find strings of gem precious gems lying on an old dirt track um so the buddha asks him you know, to pick it up and bring it right up to his eyes and that's what he has to do for that second illusion to fall away and for him to actually see what it is so it's a very clever parable and actually it's, it's, it goes even deeper than that because um, in fact the what this refers to is um, uh, 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 what the Buddha is referring to is that actually when we begin to practice insight meditation for example the first things that come up into consciousness are are usually the more shadowy elements of the unconscious the, the things that we have actively pushed away because we don't want to think about them uh, we don't want to look at them and, and it's not unusual for people when they start a buddhist practice maybe after six months once they start you know getting into it to actually come along and say well i, I thought this was going to make me a nicer person i thought i'd be less temperamental i'd be less impulsive i'd be you know less impatient but but actually i'm getting worse normally at this point that that's when the teacher will say ah good you know that's good because it means the practice is working you were always like that um ask your friends they never told you because they wanted to be friends with you and they didn't want to tell you bad things about bad mouth you to your face so um uh, you know now that you are seeing these things you are gaining insight into the way you really are um so we have this you know this is something that the swiss psychologist carl jung talked about he said we have a persona you know um this is a persona it's a and it's necessary you know this is this is the person that we project out into the world and that's fine you know if you're a doctor you have to you know sound professional and serious um and you know authoritative um at home you may be a completely different person in fact you probably are um you know maybe you you know doctors are doctors are sort of somewhat well known for having a very dark sense of humor for example because of the sort of job that they uh, that they do soldiers are the same um yeah and it's the same you know if you're a soldier on a battlefield you you know you may be terrified but you can't sh you know you, you um you, you try not to show it um because you have to be hard and you know full of uh, testosterone etc you know it's what you have to do but the mistake comes the problem comes if we mistake that persona if we believe ourselves so if we believe that actually oh, this is who i am i am this noble bold soldier that who never shows fear now because i believe that any fear that i do feel and of course as a living beings we all feel fear from time to time has to be denied has to be pushed down so when a person like that starts sitting um they might 
become feel subject to anxiety um, because that, all that anxiety has been pushed away and gone into the unconscious. And often when things go into the unconscious, um, they become quite volcanic. They, they absorb a lot of energy uh, from the unconscious. And so they balloon, you know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's like, well, we, we talk about it, don't we, with, with the lockdown. People are saying, oh, my God, when the pub's open, they'll be heaving. Even people probably who don't go to the pub normally will go because they've been denied it, you know, for so long and so, you know, um, want to go. Um, or people will just go to the, sh to the shops if they're still open, um, if they're still going, uh, and buy loads of stuff that we don't want because we can and we couldn't before. Um, and and what we're doing is this this volcanic impulse has come out, and then we'll all go like this, and we'll sort of get back to some kind of equilibrium, hopefully. Um, uh, so, uh, so yes. So when we begin to practice insight, when we begin to become more conscious, um, some of the first things that we see um, are not so pleasant and so there's a the the persona has a corollary which is called the shadow this is a another archetype here, um, uh, that's spoken about in, in sort of depth psychology and the shadow the shadow is different for all of us but we all have a shadow so the shadow represents those elements in us that we are in denial of um, and so the persona has the ones that we want to project out into the world and the shadow is the complementary side and so um, the shadow side is the is usually the first thing we begin to get particularly when we're working with the emotional uh, sides we those are the things we begin to uh, to actually see and um, one of uh, Jung's uh, pupils and assistants uh, um, uh, uh, a lady called uh, Marie Louise von Franz, who did a lot of research for Jung. She did a lot of research into fairy tales and also later um, helped him with his work on alchemy and psychology. Uh, and um, was a great psychologist in her own right. Uh, there's, if you look on YouTube, you'll find interviews with her, and uh, she does a lot of stuff on dream analysis. People who are interested in that, you know, hop over to YouTube. Um, take take a look at some of the material there on it. Might find it interesting. Anyway, she says because she she originally was a friend of uh, Jung's daughter, um, so she she met him when she was about seventeen, eighteen, something like that, um, and uh, you know was really impressed by what he was doing uh, and his psychological work, and that's what she did herself. So, um, but uh, but um, she you know heard obviously all about the archetypes but you know she said well you know I've read about them but I've never met them you know the the purpose for the the role of the in of the individuation process which is the term that Jung gave to his sort of process of integration of uh, psychic elements um, uh, uh, starts with the shadow so she said well, I better go meet the shadow and she knew that um, to meet the shadow all you really had to do was to or an easy way to do it, an easier way to do it, was to remove yourself, go and seclude yourself somewhere, and wait, because sooner or later, you'll meet the shadow. Um, it comes, because, um, you know, we use our everyday habits, our everyday distractions, um, to please ourselves, to, to live in that denial. Because remember, if we are denying reality, you know, we're denying the way things really are. Well, this is the way things really are. So you have to actively hide that from yourself. That takes effort. Um, so when you take yourself out of that um, and go and seclude yourself, you can't, you, you stop making that effort. And then the way things really are, you know, are there in front of you. So what she did, um, she lived um, near the Alps, so the European Alps. So um, she she went up into the Alps. This is Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland, yeah. She was in Switzerland, um, and uh, she went there in sort of off season, off skiing season, uh, because there are lots of ski cabins all around the place, and there uh, she that they're always left open in case you get stuck on the mountain. There's always some provision in them as well, and a little stove and you know wood stove and things like that and bedding. So she she, she went there and um, uh, she she stayed there. And uh, what she found very quickly is that she she was spending all her time chopping firewood and making elaborate meals for herself. And then after a while, she sort of realized 
actually this is this too is an avoidance tactic so she sort of made a rule to herself she said i've got enough firewood now i don't need to make any more and uh, meals can be made in half an hour maximum and and that's it rest of the time just sit in a chair and wait so those of you who practice their meditation on retreats will know this is beginning to sound a little bit familiar. Um, you just sit and wait. And uh, she did, and she sort of sat down. And then suddenly, you know, the thought came to her, what the hell am I doing? You know, I'm a lone woman here on the side of a mountain. So, you know, some crazy psycho could break in at any time. And, and you know, there's no help. I'd be on my own. Uh, and she really worried about this and to the point where she slept with the wood axe underneath her pillow. Um, and this really preyed on her mind. You know, she really thought maybe this, well, I know I'm doing the psychological work, but I really don't think is this, you know, as a sort of risk assessment, I really don't think this is a good idea. So um, she, she, was, she said she bent down, she was just pulling out the suitcase from underneath the bed, going to pack everything in and, you know, leg it down uh, back home to safety. When she suddenly thought, this is the shadow. She suddenly realized that fear, that, that fantasy, uh, that had come up in her imagination. This itself was the shadow. This was the fear that lived in her because, you know, she, she didn't realize that, uh, 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 that she was prone to these fears. And, and that was the beginning of, of her particular journey. So that was her moment um, of realization uh, uh, there. Okay. So the secret of seeing things as they really are is to take off our coloured spectacles. Um, that being as it is, with nothing extraordinary about it, nothing wonderful, is the great wonder. Sort of sounds like a contradiction, but actually it reflects, um, it reflects something that Master Rinzai said. Um, uh, he, he said, um, uh, just be your ordinary selves. Do not give yourself airs. Just be your ordinary selves. And, you know, we, we might sort of think, well, you know, I don't particularly want to be my ordinary self. Um, or maybe I do. I, I, I don't know. Maybe we sort of feel, you know, there are times when I suppose here we are in, 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 in still in lockdown, obviously. We're maybe living with family and we're sort of thinking, oh, God, I wish you lot would go away. I'm tired of this look on your faces. You know, you're driving me mad. Um, but of course, you know, we have to put a brave face on it. We're all in this together, right? You know, keep calm, carry on, and all that sort of thing. Um, whereas inside, we sort of feel we're dying a little bit. We have a little bit of a moan, but, you know, we don't always, you know, sometimes it's not so wise to tell people exactly what you think. Um, and so we, we do feel that we're being uh, disingenuous. We do feel, we might be feeling, God, I wish I could just be my ordinary self with this. But actually, that's not the ordinary self that uh, either Master Sesan or Master Rinzai is, is talking about. Um, uh, he says that, that even when we think we're being our ordinary self, we're not. We're still, we're still um, giving ourselves airs. Uh, we're still um, wanting to be or, or imagining ourselves to be something that we're not because we fall for it ourselves. We, we believe it in ourselves too. You know, rather like, you know, the example with Mary Louise von Franz confronting her own shadow. Um, you know, when we, or like the, the Zen student who says, I thought this was going to make me better, but actually it's making me worse. Um, so confronting the shadow is always a moral dilemma, you know, because um, it, it's interesting, so, you know, so, not everything in the shadow is 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 bad. Not everything is is evil. You know, our impulses, most of them are not. Some of them are. Um, the homicidal ones are obviously. Um, and I remember, you know, um, I remember in, in my own experience um, when I first, you know, I, I can't remember if I've told this story before. I forget. Um, a long time ago when I, I worked for the union and I had a boss who I hated uh, and I really hated and you know I'm not the sort of person who sees himself as a hater you know I am not a hater um, but I hated him um, really hated him and you know I used to have these homicidal fantasies um, about him because I was in a situation where he had a lot of power over me he he was a bully he threatened a lot of people around me he didn't actually bully me directly but what I hated him for was that I was frightened of him and and he made me feel that fear 
uh, and I and that really made me feel, you know, um, I thought, you know, you can push my buttons. It's, you know, we don't like it when someone can push our buttons, do we? We feel manipulated. Uh, but actually, the reason that they can push the buttons is that we made those buttons for, and so other people can push them either, um, uh, either consciously or unconsciously. Quite often the latter, but sometimes the former too. Anyway, so, you know, um, I remember, so I used to have these wild fans, and, and I was shocked. I was really shocked at the sorts, you know, in that rage, in that inner rage, suppressed rage. I was shocked about how powerful that was. And, and I remember going home on the bus once and I was having one of these, something had happened that day. And, um, you know, I looked up uh, and there was a woman sat opposite me on the bus and she looked absolutely horrified. Uh, and I suddenly realized that whilst I, this fantasy was going on, my face must have sort of contorted into some, you know, um, complete psycho uh, and she you know obviously terrified her and that was when it really came through to me that I thought oh my god I've got to do something about this I've really got to stop indulging um, in those fantasies whatever you know yeah he's a bad man uh, but it doesn't matter you know this is more important um, and that was when I really had to start taking the training seriously uh, because I was worried that this was going to grow and grow and grow and you know one day could explode and what would happen then so this you know confrontation with the shadow is always always presents us with a moral dilemma uh, like that so uh, and yet these things are in us and and this is one of the beautiful things um, I have to say one of the beautiful things I really love about Buddhism for me personally was the story or the not the story but the um, yeah, uh, it was said that in the Mahayana, uh, that the Buddha, you know, in, if you read the Mahayana Sutras, the, the Buddha speaks to not just people, um, but also all beings, you know, mythological beings, gods and devas and yakshas and demons and, you know, um, all, you know, it's, there's a huge audience of uh, uh, uh of different different characters and different sorts of beings but it was said that that even the demons came to listen to him you know the wild demons um uh, would come to listen to him. and these these are demons in the elemental sense you know these are the these are the forces of rage or lust or um you know earthquake um the uh, or storm these are the elemental powers that are amoral you know they they're not immoral they're they're just amoral it's like you know when a volcano erupts it's you know I suppose if if your house is at the bottom it's you might see it as an evil god but if you're far enough away you can you can see it as a spectacle as a spectacle of nature um so these are daimonic forces in the greek sense perhaps more but they can, they can be highly destructive and the buddha was said to have converted them to buddhism as well but it didn't stop their daimonic nature um what he did was was he placed them on the gates of temples so that they would become dharma protectors and if you go to you know chinese or uh, temples as was and certainly japanese temples now you will see these wrathful deities as they're called you know with bulging eyes and lolling bloody tongues with skulls you know and a necklace round them carrying great meat cleavers um, and they're protecting the dharma and i think that's wonderful because the implication is that um evil things are not evil in themselves um, they are evil because they are misplaced they're, they're put somewhere um where they don't fit and therefore they, they become destructive but that because nature is interconnected and interrelated there is a harmony and and if this uh if this impulse finds its place then it can serve it can you know it can serve a useful purpose and i think i think that's a wonderful ideal uh, and something that uh, uh, is certainly worth certainly worth remembering when we're exploring our own inner life and we come across something that seems very dark you know i mean even that homicidal rage that i thought yeah it was misplaced towards him because you know you can't just you know well it's not a good thing to go running after people with meat cleavers but having said that you know um there are times in history when we've had to, when our ancestors probably did have to do some pretty despicable stuff and did you know we eat each other and we you know um seize territory and all this sort of stuff 
the um, the unpalatable truth is that if they didn't do that, you and me, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. And that's true. And it's not a comfortable truth. Um, and that's not advocating it. And it's not saying that it can't change, but it's also not denying it. You know, we have, we are the result of blood on the hands as well. Um, and that's a truth. And that's, you know, that's a dark truth. And there are dark truths. Um, and that's why being our ordinary selves is, is very hard. Um, because it means living in humility uh, and accepting those things about ourselves that we would uh, possibly rather, uh, rather not see. However, the upside of that, the upside of that is that when one has seen the darkness in oneself, one can accept it in others as well, which again is not to say that we are advocating it, but it makes it much more difficult to condemn another as the other, as the Antichrist, as Satan incarnate, if we know that we have that darkness in ourselves. And, you know, that's that's something that is recognized. You know, in the New Testament, do not try and take the plank out of your um, adversary's eye. Uh, sorry, they do not try and take the splinter out of your adversary's eye. Uh, remove the large chunk of wood you've got in your own first. You know, that, that acknowledgement, you know, let him who is without sin cast the first stone to the adulterous woman and all this sort of stuff and they all sort of you know disappeared off because everybody had committed sin of course so you know when we're on our high horse we can forget that you know the big pristine me um so yes the taking those rose-colored spectacles off and seeing things clearly allows us a release it allows us to experience the compassion as well and the strength as well because when you're not fighting yourself anymore then you've got a lot of energy at your disposal you know repression takes a lot of energy takes a lot of strength um and and that you know is part of the reason why we can feel um that life can feel listless if we're if we're pushing a lot of things away uh, and we live in fear of course if we're fighting ourselves so um yeah this is the this is why realization is also a release from suffering but we have the trust we have the trust in the form you know we we have we, the form which is made up of the precepts um and the goodwill uh, towards ourselves and uh, and towards others as well so the ethical framework is there but um you know it's not allowed we don't cling to that either um so that we don't live in denial uh, of that dark side too okay well i think we'll leave it there our time's up for today uh thanks for coming along and um hopefully see you all next week have a good week enjoy the sunshine all right take care by the way just to say as i always do um if you're not signed up to the zen gateway newsletter you can always go over to www.thezengateway.com and there you can uh, find lots of material on the teachings and on practice uh, meditation daily life practice mindfulness practice um and if you have any questions you know generally if you have any questions i'd love to hear them and we'll be happy to answer to talk to them um you can send them to me at the zen gateway at gmail.com the Zen Gateway at gmail.com. Great. Okay. Till next week. Take care. Bye bye.